I'm your host today here on Dreamland, and uh, today we're back with an old friend of ours, Stanton Freeman, nuclear physicist, uh, researcher extraordinaire, and uh, today we're going to be talking about a really interesting topic. This is one that really tickles my fancy, among <laughs> other things. Um, this is his new book written along with Kathleen Martin, entitled Science Was Wrong. Uh, this is great because this is, we stop and think, I think we all kind of realize that all throughout history, um, every time the experts tell us something, more than likely it turns out to be wrong. And it certainly makes me wonder why that we continue to not only listen, but to allow laws to be enacted and policies and regulations to be enacted that, that are based on these same experts who have proven so wrong in the past. So, Stan, tell us, from your standpoint, what is the most egregious example you can think of uh, of, a, of an expert who has told us something wrong? Well, the I, I suppose, you know, you'd think me as a nuclear physicist would push along the technology end, but... My favorite, one of my favorite characters, and then Kathleen wrote a whole chapter. We each wrote seven chapters in this book, incidentally. Uh, uh, thank God for computers, because we live a long ways apart. <laughs> um, is Ignaz Semmelweis? Um, now he was a physician in Europe in the 1800s, early 1800s, and he was a pretty sharp character. And they were just beginning to get into the practice of women coming to hospitals to have their babies. And this hospital, the uh, biggest one in uh, Vienna, I guess, um, they uh, early on, they were using midwives. That was standard practice. And uh, 2 or 3% of the women would come down with childbed fever. This is before germ theory and stuff, so all they knew was that they got very sick and they died, and usually the babies died too. Anyway, then they set up uh, half of the place was going to be with the doctors, uh, the male doctors who were in training, residents uh, in gynecology and such things. And they would, they had this standard practice of they'd do autopsies in the afternoon, or in the morning rather, and come down and examine women and deliver babies in the afternoon. But turns out in that part of lying in the hospital, 20% of the women came down with childbed fever and died. Uh, that's a lot of people. So Semmelweis uh, had a friend who had a scalpel nick uh, when doing an autopsy upstairs, and uh, within a few days he came down with childbed fever of all things and had all the symptoms and died. Well, Semmelweis was a very observant character, and uh, he figured out that uh, something was wrong here. You know, it was being infected. They didn't use the word, but anyway. And so he instituted strict measures, which sound uh, perfectly normal from our point of view, but the doctors had to wash their hands with a special soap and use nail brushes and going between where they were doing the dissections or autopsies and coming down to deliver the babies. And uh, he kept very good records, and it turns out dropped the uh, mortality rate for childbed fever down to 3%. But he incurred the wrath, if you will, of the head of the hospital, head of the department, who eventually forced him out for being insubordinate because this was ridiculous, uh, you know, the mark of a good doctor back then was how bloody your apron was. <laughs> I mean, Semmelweis was such a, a character that he insisted on changing sheets more often than once a month in the hospital. <laughs> anyway, uh, he had done good research. He published papers, but he was forever dishonored and died uh, at an earlier age than he should have died. And until uh, germ theory got accepted, dozens decades later, uh, women were dying because of the hard-nosedness of this guy who said he knew best, Dr. Klein, as a matter of fact. And now, it, admittedly, eventually, on the 100th anniversary of his birth, the stamp was issued in Semmelweis's honor. But it so well illustrates 
the tendency of smart people to say stupid to say stupid things because of ego arrogance. I know better. If that were true, I would know about it. You know, all this kind of stuff. So he's one of my favorites. Another one, of course, is Dr. Simon Newcomb, one of the great, well, America's best-known astronomer of the 19th century. And he was convinced, uh, after giving it considerable thought, that if there was one thing that was a demonstrable physical fact, it was that man would never fly any distance in a machine. And he said that rather loudly two months before the Wright brothers' first flight. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, this guy was so important that when he died, the President of the United States attended his funeral. Uh, but we have in the book, there are many examples of people fighting against uh, new technology because of their arrogance and their ignorance. It's, it's always that combination. And, of course, there is a whole chapter on UFOs, which I wrote, and Kathleen wrote an excellent one on uh, UFO abductions. But when it comes to uh, uh, flight, one of my favorite guys, and he was an arrogant guy too, but he knew what he was talking about, was Billy Mitchell. And everybody knows he was court-martialed. Well, Billy Mitchell was an officer who flew airplanes in World War One. He was involved in the combat. And after the war, he had the gall to speak out, saying that aviation had revolutionized warfare, and soon we'd be sinking ships with bombs dropped from the sky. And boy, was he laughed at for that. The Secretary of the Navy stated that uh, he'd stand on any ship that was going to be bombed. You'd never be able to do that. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, as a coda to that little story, uh, in the late 1930s, uh, they had war exercises in the Pacific. And as usual, as, as was the tradition, they kind of pitted the older admirals against some of the younger officers. And the younger officers, they had listened very attentively to Billy Mitchell. And so they devised a plan to attack Pearl Harbor, and they were going to use aircraft carriers, and they were going to use aircraft, and they were going to attack on a Sunday morning when nobody was prepared. They were going to come over the north end of the island where there's always a cloud cover, and when they break through the cloud cover, they'd be over Pearl Harbor, and they would bomb the battleships and they would sink the Pacific fleet. And uh, on paper, theoretically, this worked. But the old admiral said, oh, no, 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 that could never work because we'd be shooting back at them. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, there were Japanese military attachés that were there observing the war oh, games. Goodness. And a few years later, they, of course, pulled it off on December the 7th, 1941, and it definitely worked again. Isn't that amazing? We, we I, Apparently, we are the ones who drew up the plans for the attack on well, Pearl Harbor. You know, there, there is another uh, side story to this on uh, at the Army-Navy football game. On November 29th, 1941, uh, in the, uh, you know, the, the pass book, if you will, the program for the game, and that's a big competition, as you know. Right. Uh, there was a picture of the USS Arizona, and there was a statement that nobody had ever sunk a battleship from the sky. <laughs> Eight days later, the Japanese attacked and they sank the USS Arizona. 1,100 guys died because of that. Uh, we were not prepared. I, I like your story as part of that. My goodness. And, you know, it's funny. There's another story in the book that reflects stuff starting here that came back to bite us, uh, the story of eugenics. Uh, you know, Hitler, the racist, and the super right. race, master race, all this kind of stuff. Well, that began. That actually <laughs> began in the United States, was supported yeah. by some very rich people. Sterilization of the unfit was the, and they had competitions at county fairs, the fittest families, you know, for being tall and, and blonde, I presume, too. <laughs> you know, the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who is now regarded as one of the greatest legal minds in this country, was a big supporter of eugenics. Yeah, and he, in that famous case of... Uh, Claire Buck, I think her name was, uh, uh, he ruled for sterilization because uh, 
three generations of, you know, inferior people was enough kind of thing. And so Hitler if, and the Nazis didn't invent all that; they just carried oh no. it to an extreme. <laughs> Well, you know, I have a personal interest in that. They were giving IQ tests to immigrants in English. And if they didn't pass, they were going to keep them out. And, of course, my all my grandparents came from Eastern Europe and certainly couldn't speak English when they came. So they got by. But uh, the attitudes, the... Uh, uh, the tone, the arrogance again. If there was anybody in your family that was uh, inferior, a deaf person, a blind person, oh boy, that whole family now should be uh, yeah. you have to sterilized go away. and stuff. And uh, Well, I'm going to have to interrupt here. We have to take a short break, but uh, we're going to continue with this fascinating conversation with Stanton Freeman about his new book, Science Was Wrong, uh, in just a few moments. This is Whitley Strieber, Unknown Country Subscribers. I am talking in the subscriber special interview to Kathleen Marden, Stanton Friedman's co-author. She's written an extraordinary chapter on alien abductions for Science is Wrong. And not only that, she is Betty Hill's niece, and she's been working with abductees for years. So if you would like to get in touch with her, her email address is kmarden at aol.com. That is K-M-A-R-D-E-N at aol.com. And her website is Kathleen-Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N dot com. Uh, she, send her a little bit about your experience and your phone number and she will call you back. She does not charge for her work with abductees. She does not do hypnosis, but she will certainly listen to you as she can only call back to U.S. phone numbers. So uh, let her know that if you have a U.S. phone number, you can do this. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland with expert host Jim Mars. Howdy, we're back here, and this is Jim Mars. Today we're talking with Stanton Freeman, and uh, we're talking about his new book, Science Was Wrong, and we've been talking about some of the examples of uh, not only in medicine but in uh, military technology, uh, aviation, where the experts basically have been wrong. But, Stanton, early on you mentioned something, and it piqued my curiosity. Uh, to just take a minute or two and explain to me how you and your co-author, Kathleen Martin, you don't live in proximity. Uh, tell tell us how how you managed to get together and produce this book. Well, it wasn't often getting together. It was writing and sending files back and forth via the computer. Ah, We'd so meet, it's all we, done by computer. Well, yeah, frankly, and you know, I don't need to tell you, Jim, but some people don't realize that now the authors uh, do what I'd call the old galleys. I mean, you you prepare a PDF file. And you send it in, and they edit it, and they send it back, and you've got three days to read it on a computer and make any small changes you might want to make. Mm -hmm. And in two weeks, you've got books in your hand, which is right. truly incredible. I mean, no galleys anymore, uh, and you better be ready. I, I, I must tell you, I had one crazy question. Uh, in, incidentally, publishers are very sensitive to lawsuits. You know about that. And, of course. Uh, uh, they want to make sure you get permission to uh, use the materials you're using, if you're using quotes or pictures or anything like that. and uh, But I got the strangest question I've ever had, and somebody wanted a citation for the page number for a definition from a dictionary. <laughs> and I mean, I have never, ever, I don't know about you, but I have never, ever looked up a word in a dictionary by page number. <laughs> well, now, let me see. Let me see. Uh, if you're going to look up... Uh... Uh, Friedman, for example, I would say you'd start with the S. <laughs> right? I, I think that's a good idea. And it, it, but they want to know the page number. The word that I gave a definition for, and some people may want, what, what, what is he referring to the dictionary? The word was anecdotal because I wanted to give a dictionary definition because the nasty, noisy negativists about UFOs will frequently try to pass off the crazy notion that all we have is anecdotal data. Right. And, you know, stories told by you, brief stories, personal histories, that sort of thing. And so I blasted that. But I wanted to use a dictionary definition of the word rather than 
my presuming everybody knew exactly what I meant, but to justify my position that this was uh, nonsense. <laughs> the, the stories aren't anecdotal. Uh, when you look at cases like the RB47 and others, you know, hour long, many witnesses, uh, radar on the ground, radar in the sky, that's not an anecdote. <laughs> no, no, and in journalism, uh, you know, there's been an old rule of thumb that if you have three, if you have three persons who will go on the record and, and tell a particular story, then that constitutes a story. In other words, one person uh, could be a crackpot, two sure. persons could be a crackpot and his mother, okay? But if you have three people, then that's enough to warrant a story. That's not saying that it's confirmed, documented, and true, but but three people telling the story constitutes, in, in, in journalism, uh, enough uh, credibility to warrant at least a story. And, of course, when it comes to UFOs, we've probably got on the record, I don't know, three million. <laughs> I mean, it's like just, it just Big goes number, on yeah. worldwide, yes. And, by, and as long as we're on that... <clears throat> Stanton, let me ask you this. Why, uh, right now, there's starting to be a big flap, and even covered in the mainstream media, there was a story in Reuters today oh. about the press conference about the military officers who are, have come forward and said that UFOs who were seen and apparently were interfering with the uh, launch codes of some of our nuclear rockets going back into the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, and they're, you know, it's like, whoa, look at this. I know I've written about that. I know you've written about that. I know others have written about that. Why is it? Why are they just now acting like this is a story? Well, the media are maybe slowly waking up, uh, and if you get enough people in one place with sufficient background, uh, officers who were at these uh, rocket launching facilities and all the rest of that, and uh, there, there's, so there's been a lot of discussion because now we're getting a critical mass, if you don't mind my nuclear kind of thing here, <laughs> uh, of stories of respectable people saying strong things. And uh, it is I should point out that some of these things have happened in other countries as well. Right. And, you know, I'm not saying the uh, aliens are here to keep us from blowing ourselves up. Maybe it's to preserve it so they can take over. I mean, you can... There's a zillion different plots here, but <laughs> they don't want to irradiate their food. Uh, well, why not? I know that <laughs> sometimes irradiating food is good for the food. Come on, Jim. <laughs> I'm one of these nuclear types. Remember, actually, I worked on. The, I visited one of the world's largest facilities for food irradiation in Holland. Uh, oh. oh, back in the 80s. Uh, but the, the thing here is that I, I'm intrigued by anything nuclear, of course, because I worked in industry for 14 years, mm -hmm. and it does get me to something that, that's an extension of what's talked about in the book. Uh, one of the major arguments made against UFOs, of course, is that you can't get here from there. Uh, and, you know, we have the head of the Hayden Planetarium going public with our fastest Voyager spacecraft would take 70,000 years to get to the nearest stars star and scientists want their data faster you know while they're still alive he doesn't bother to say that it doesn't have a propulsion system on it but one of the crazy things in today's world and the attitudes from the noisy negativists uh about you can't get here from there is they seem to still be thinking in terms of chemical rockets right. it's as if this whole other world outside of academia didn't exist. The only people are doing research are professors. And this came up in this twice. It's hard to believe. But two different people told me, Stan, if Roswell had happened in 1947, they'd have pulled half the professors out of universities to work on that. And that didn't happen, so it must not have happened. And I was aghast. They seem to be totally unaware of the huge research and development establishment, if you will, that was set up during the war, the Manhattan Project, still exists, and I visited many of these facilities, and they're big, and they're competent, they got the best equipment, and, and they have secret. high security. And they're and, secret. Uh, gee, yeah, you they don't, don't publish or perish, you Jim. Would you believe that? How can they be a researcher if they're not in the publisher parish business? And <laughs> let me give you an example. Uh, several years ago, I checked on three nuclear weapons labs on uh, Lawrence Livermore 
and Sandia, and of course Los Alamos. At that time, they each employed more than 8,000 people, and they each had an annual budget over a billion dollars. And the three together, their total budget was more than the National Science Foundation budget for everything it did. And that doesn't count Oak Ridge and Hanford and Lockheed and Westinghouse and all the other people that are in that business. And the, the final part of that, to get back to nuclear, is they don't seem to be aware that we have been using nuclear energy for propulsion for rather a long time. Nautilus went to sea in 1956. Admiral Rickover's baby, hundreds of nuclear submarines have been built, not only by the U.S., but by Russia and Britain, France, etc., China. Uh, and the logical extension of that, and this really sends floors people, I point out, and I think the picture's in the book maybe, that um, we have nuclear-powered aircraft carriers that can operate for 18 years without refueling. Boy, that's a lot of gas that didn't get burned, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And, you know, uh, that you, of all people, uh, will understand this. Uh, one of the theories <clears throat> about what brought down the Twin Towers on 9-11 was that it could have been uh, the use of a small uh, mini-nuke or a small nuclear device. And, of course, people say, oh, well, that can't be. And apparently because they still have the idea of big boy, you know, this huge, big atomic bomb. And yet... Uh, uh, you, you know, back in the 50s, they were using nuclear artillery shells, right? They were firing right. artillery shells out of cannons. So you've got something, you know, about the, I don't know, the size of a... Well, you know, you, you, I'm glad you brought that up because it shocks people to realize that in 1943, let's say, a big bomb was a 10-ton blockbuster. Boy, was that destructive, and it took a huge B-29 to carry it, you know. Mm -hmm. In 1945, we set off our first atomic bombs, and they released the energy equivalent to about 15,000 tons of TNT. And then we went big time in 1952. I mean, we'd only figured out how the sun works in 1938, theoretically. 1952, being the nice, friendly earthlings we are, we set off our first H-bomb, released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. So in less than 10 years, in other words, mm -hmm. and there were experts who told President Truman that the notion of an atomic bomb was ridiculous. Won't An work. expert on explosives said that. Can't work. Yeah. And now, think about that for a minute. From 10 to 15,000 to 10 million. And the Russians out there, as they exploded one that was 57 million tons of TNT Holy equipment. Cow. And that's that's impressive to me, depressive too. But and yet that that kind of power could be carried in a bomb that could be carried in an airplane. And uh, that's right. And, yeah, that's right. And the the kicker here is too. And I worked on a study of fusion propulsion way back in the early 60s, uh, under the direction of a man who had been head of the fusion program at Oak Ridge, John Luce. Brilliant man, an incredible background. He had a high school diploma, 40 patents, and an honorary Ph.D. in physics. <laughs> and he was always doing things that the Ph.D. said couldn't be done. Boy, he had an instinct for how the world operated. But uh, fusion propulsion allows you, and I talk about this in the book in the chapter on space, to kick particles out the back end of a rocket that have, would you believe, 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in a dumb old chemical rocket? Mm. Now, it, what I'm getting at here, to get back to where we were, about uh, academia and this outside of academia research and development, uh, these guys are stuck at the level of the Pony Express. I mean, I want to move information in a hurry. I don't use the Pony Express. I use the Internet. They're still talking about chemical rockets right. or chemical bombs. And, you know, we're, we're in real trouble if we listen to these people. And I'm sure you're aware of all those silly comments, Stephen Hawking and others, about alien visitation. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Well, you know, for years they don't exist. Well, if they do exist, they're, they're, they probably want to eat us. But let me ask you this. Stanton, as we as we are kind of running out of time here, what 
Well, what do you think? Uh, uh, is UFO the big issue today, or is there some, any other thing you can think of today that we accept as commonplace, common knowledge, we all know this, and that you can see in a few years is uh, people are going to say, hey, well, gee, that was wrong. Well, I think more in medicine, I think we're beginning to understand that we've let the drug companies run the show, right. that natural stuff will turn out to be less damaging and more useful and far less expensive. And I, I think people are going to live longer because they're paying more attention to what's really going on instead of listening to the salesman. You know, exactly. when we were young, Jim, we didn't have ads in Reader's Digest for buying prescription drugs, <laughs> did we? Really? Uh, uh, you, know. you know, but but what worries me on that is you're absolutely right. And But just as the uh, average guy is beginning to wake up that perhaps some of the more natural remedies are, are less intrusive, less invasive, and then probably just as or more effective, uh, they are passing more and more laws to restrict and outlaw the natural uh, uh, and herbal and homeopathic remedies. Yeah. What's with that? <laughs> well, people in power want to stay in power, and that's really one of the themes of the book. Right. That the guy at the top insists on doing things his way. The British astronomer Royal said space travel is utter bilge a year before Sputnik, of course. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, there, there are many examples, but the, the important point we try to make in the book is that this kind of tone, this attitude from the big shots has consequences. And they're not always good consequences. People die, progress gets delayed, yep. the wrong people beat you to the punch because your guys weren't paying attention. Uh, the story of World War II has a lot of that, as you know. So Yes. Uh, and you know that holds true actually for every war. Uh, in the in the American Civil War, uh, they for all, almost till the end of the war, they were still trying to use the uh, 18th century Napoleonic War tactics, which is the, when they had the old smoothbore muskets and you moved masses of troops up to within 50 yards of each other and you banged away yeah. and, until one side or the other gave way, and they were still using those tactics, and yet, 10 years before the war, they had developed the rifled musket, which effectively extended the range of the rifles to like 300 yards. So they're trying to march mass troops up to 50 yards when they started picking them off at 300 yards, and that was why there was so much slaughter in the American Civil War. Boy, there sure was, too. Somebody pays the price, whether it's the women Always. delivering babies or the soldiers being stuck in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong equipment because some big shot said something was impossible. Uh, I don't think you mentioned this in the book, and, and I actually have read the book, and folks, it's really a good read. And this is one to, to keep out for your neighbors to say, hey, you know, most everything you think you know is probably wrong. But the, and, I, and Stanton, I don't have the, the names, dates in front of me, but the basic story was, and I'm sure you may remember this, is that all through the 1600s, 1700s, and early 1800s, the British, who of course were the greatest sea power in the world, had a real problem with scurvy. And their, so, their sailors would come down with scurvy, yeah. and there were many, many, many deaths. Well, back way in, like in the mid to late 1700s, uh, a British doctor finally uh, realized that he, he thought this was a vitamin deficiency. But, of course, the uh, medical authorities at the time said, oh, no, that can't be. And they continued to look for that germ that caused scurvy. And, and this went on for like 100 years until uh, into the mid to late 1800s when they finally said, you know, maybe it's a vitamin deficiency. They started carrying limes. Uh, yep. and lemons on their ships. This is where the, the slang limey comes from. Yep. And they carried limes, and the sailors would suck on limes or lemons, and, and and they had no more cases of scurvy. But it took them 100 years to after they knew what the cause was before they would accept it. And they also, incidentally, it took another umpteen years to find out uh, to isolate vitamin C. They right. didn't know what it was in the lime that was doing the good, but you don't have to know that in order to use it. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, we're about out of time here, but I certainly appreciate you spending the time with us today. Stanton Freeman, uh, physicist, um, 
UFO researcher, general all-around good guy. And uh, we. I have a website too, www.stantonfriedman.com. And where can you get your book? We well, you can get it from the website with PayPal or any major bookstore or Amazon, dare I say. Uh, the books you buy from me or Kathy, uh, you get signatures from both of us. You don't get that from Amazon or Barnes & Noble. But uh, the, the book's doing well, and we've been very pleased. There's some good reviews on uh, Amazon.com. It's a good place to look for those, as long as you get the good guys writing in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, right. Well, you know, on Amazon, you you, you have to figure that uh, you we've got a nation of 307 million people out there. So, you know, if uh, a fraction of one percent is unbalanced, you're still going to get some letters, right? That's so, right. <laughs> so we understand that. Well, listen, uh, here on Dreamland, I'm sure that most people know you, Stan. And they appreciate your work, and and uh, I guarantee you, this, this is a book you want to have on your bookshelf. Thank you. Science was wrong, indeed. <laughs> yeah, right. But you're not wrong in this book. All right, I Stanton Freeman, Jim Mars here speaking to you. Dreamland past. So, Stanton, tell us from your standpoint. What is the most egregious example you can think of uh, of, a, of an expert who has told us something wrong? Well, the uh, I suppose, you know, you'd think me as a nuclear physicist would push along the technology ends, but my favorite, one of my favorite characters, and then Kathleen wrote a whole chapter. We each wrote seven chapters in this book, incidentally. Uh, uh, thank God for computers because we live a long ways apart. <laughs> um is Ignaz Semmelweis. Um, now, he was a physician in Europe in the 1800s, early 1800s, and he was a pretty sharp character, and they were just beginning to get into the practice of women coming to hospitals to have their babies. And this hospital, uh, the biggest one in uh, Vienna, I guess, um, they uh, early on, they were using midwives. That was standard practice. And 2 or 3% of the women would come down with childbed fever. This is before germ theory and stuff, so all they knew was that they got very sick and they died, and usually the babies died too. Anyway, then they set up uh, half of the place was going to be with the doctors, uh, the male doctors who were in training, residents uh, in gynecology and such things, and they would... They had this standard practice of they do autopsies in the afternoon, or in the morning rather, and come down and examine women and deliver babies in the afternoon. But turns out in that part of the lying in hospital, 20% of the women came down with childbed fever and died. Uh, that's a lot of people. So Semmelweis uh, had a friend who had a scalpel neck uh, when doing the hospital, head of the department, who eventually forced him out for being insubordinate because this was ridiculous. Uh, you know, the mark of a good doctor back then was how bloody your apron was. <laughs> I mean, Semmelweis was such a, a character that he insisted on changing sheets more often than once a month in the hospital. <laughs> anyway, uh, he had done good research. He published papers, but he was for ever dishonored and died uh, at an earlier age than he should have died. And until uh, germ theory got accepted, dozens of decades later, uh, women were dying because of the hard-nosedness of this guy who said he knew best, Dr. Klein, as a matter of fact. And now, it, admittedly, eventually, on the 100th anniversary of his birth, the stamp was issued in Semmelweis's honor. But it's so well built an autopsy upstairs, and uh, within a few days he came down with childbed fever of all things and had all the symptoms and died. Well, Semmelweis was a very observant character, and uh, he figured out that uh, something was wrong here. You know, he was being infected. They didn't use the word, but anyway. And so he instituted strict measures, which sound... Uh, perfectly normal from our point of view, but the doctors had to wash their hands with a special soap and use nail brushes 
and going between where they were doing the dissections or autopsies and coming down to deliver the babies. And uh, it, he kept very good records, and it turns out dropped the uh, mortality rate for childbed fever down to 3%. But he incurred the wrath, if you will, of the head of the I'm your host today here on Dreamland, and uh, today we're back with an old friend of ours, Stanton Freeman, nuclear physicist, uh, researcher extraordinaire, and uh, today we're going to be talking about a really interesting topic. This is one that really tickles my fancy, among <laughs> other things. Um, this is his new book written along with Kathleen Martin, entitled Science Was Wrong. Uh, <laughs> this is great because this is, when you stop and think, I think we all kind of realize that all throughout history, um, every time the experts tell us something, more than likely it turns out to be wrong. And it certainly makes me wonder why that we continue to not only listen, but to allow laws to be enacted and policies and regulations to be enacted that, that are based on these same experts who have proven so wrong 